We are very glad to host the second talk in this art lecture series here at Ode to Art, uh, conducted by Mr. Jeffrey Say, curator and lecturer at LaSalle College of the Arts. After our first uh, interesting talk about what is art and what is it for, Mr. Say will be giving us the requirements and basic criteria on this second lecture on the topic of how to look at a work of art and how to have a better understanding and appreciation of the art around us. We hope that after this talk, we'll be able to have a clearer eye for art and be able to put into words our feelings and thoughts about certain artworks. Our education very often taught us how to think in words and not in shapes, colours or forms. This departure from our established way of thinking is not an easy task and that is why this lecture aims to analyse and perhaps to teach us how to look and analyse and interpret in our own words a work of art to be able to understand and perhaps discuss about it. In the same way that good ear is necessary to understand music, good eyes and a keen interest are equally necessary to reach a full comprehension of feelings and ideas expressed through art. We hope that this talk will help all of us to improve on our observation skills and enable us to interpret directly and personally without any diluted verbal translation and to depend on our own eyes, minds and emotions. I hope that at the end of the talk, we will be able to read and create a direct relationship with this piece of art to perfect our interest in the subject matter. And we want to thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Say, once again for conducting this interesting topic and this talk. Okay, good. Okay, nice to see some familiar faces again and some not so familiar faces. That's fine, you know, it's always good to have a fresh audience as well. Um, I'm glad the Hayes condition has improved somewhat, you know, or else I think, you know, uh, probably half the places here will not be, you know, filled. So thankfully that's uh, kind of over for the moment, right? Because uh, I think, when was that? Last, just on Saturday, right? I had a talk cancelled because uh, I think at that time the, the, the Hayes, uh, the PSI was above 300, right? Okay, so people tend to stay indoors. All right, um, I think as, uh, you know, as Chris pointed out earlier, okay, I mean, I'm sure all of you have been to a museum, okay, as well as uh, a gallery like this. Okay, you are now in an art gallery, okay? And uh, when you encounter a work of art, okay, you are now surrounded by works of art, okay? Now, what is normally your first response, right? What is normally your first response? I mean, I've heard responses like, uh, you know, I like this work, right? I like this work, right? This work is fabulous, you know, this work is beautiful, right? But when you probe further and you ask that person, now what do you think this, what, what do you like this work? You know, I just like it, right? Um, you know, I mean, it's good to, um, I suppose, to, I mean, really, your, your response to work of art is normally based on gut feeling, intuition instinct okay that's fine okay but i suppose a work of art is a product of you know an artist um it's a whole process of of the the creative thought and feelings okay of of what has, an artist has undergone okay so what i'm trying to say is that a work of art is a very complex um piece of work all right that i would say justify a more um maybe complex response from us Okay, maybe complex is too strong a word to use, okay? But maybe a more uh, informed response, okay, from us, right? Okay. And, but, you know, when you look at the work of art, for example, this, you say, oh, I like the colours, right? Okay, maybe sometimes it's as far as you go, okay? But what do you like about the colours, right? Okay, what do you like about the colours, for example, right? I mean, what do you like about the way the artists put the colours together? Is it the arrangement of the colours? or certain colours that the artists use, okay, etc. So to, tonight, um, I'm going to sort of um, provide you with, with a kind of a visual language, you know, a very basic language, right, to, to, to speak more confidently about a work of art. Okay, I mean, I can't do miracles in one session, okay, but um, hopefully after this session, you'll be able to, you know, um, whenever you step into a gallery or museum again, you'll be able to at least respond more intelligently, I would say, or, or confidently about a work of art. 
Okay, so I've entitled the uh, the topic, right? Subject matters. Okay, I'll be defining what subject matter is, right? In a moment. Now this is a a, a quote. Okay, by Ed Reinhardt. Ed Reinhardt was uh, an American minimalist artist. Okay, who practiced in the mid um, uh, 1900s, right? He's famous for his uh, so-called um, black paintings, right? And he, you know, he called his paintings paintings to end all paintings, right? But um, you know, they are all black, but there are also shades, right? Various shades and hues of grey. Okay. Now, I think Ed Reinhardt's quote is very appropriate. Okay, when describing a work of art. Okay, just look at this work. Now, who doesn't know this work? Put up your hand. Okay, a lot of you know. Okay. Now, what makes this work? I mean, it's just a drawing, a painting of a lady. Okay. What makes it so fascinating? I mean, today it still continues to fascinate us. Right? I mean, have you ever thought about it? Okay. And many things still appear to be unresolved. Okay, I mean, there's still so much discussion about this painting, but it's just a painting of a lady. Okay, so Ed Reinhardt's quotation holds true that a work of art is not as simple as it looks. Okay, and knowing an artist, okay, an artist, you know, you know, thinks deeply and you know has many ideas. Okay, and and uh, you know, he would he or she would want to to you know to make a work of art, you know appear not as simple as it looks okay but we'll come to that again right later on i mean what makes this this work so fascinating is it the mystique surrounding this work okay is it the mysterious smile okay do you find something about a smile okay right it's there but yet it's not there okay it disappears after a while right now i'll be talking about this work um, shortly The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, is it something about the, the kind of um, fantastic background? Okay, that makes this painting, uh, you know, uh, fascinating. Now, this is a quote taken from the book, How to Look at Modern Art. Okay, it's a book that I highly recommend because, um, I mean, first and foremost, it's easy to read. Okay, and gives you a very good introduction to modern art, in particular abstract art. Okay, because modern art is um, dominated by abstract art, right? And you know, he says that uh, Philip Yanowen says that art's most satisfying function is that it allows us to exercise our minds, right? Okay, exercise our minds. Okay, and um, an artwork will establish certain boundaries by subject matter, style, materials, and techniques. Okay, I'll talk about that right, in the course of this, uh, this talk, all right, this lecture. Okay. And it, lets, it then lets us observe and analyze these givens by probing and musing. Okay, it's only by probing and musing a work of art okay, that we are able to enjoy it. Right? It's only by probing and musing. Okay. And um, also, we can then proceed in a game of speculation and interpretation. Okay, I like, I like the way how he puts it, a game, right? Okay, art is like a game of speculation and interpretation. Okay, I think that's what makes, um, you know, a work of art so fascinating. Okay, is that... Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm told to stand here. <laughs> so I'm not able to look at... I can still see it. Okay. Now, okay, so there are no right or wrong answers. Okay, to a work of art. So the next time when you, you, you are afraid that you know you might give a wrong answer, okay, there's no such thing okay, as a wrong answer. Okay, because you are really entitled to your own interpretation. Of course, your own interpretation has to be um, really well, you know, in a way informed by um, you know, it has to be in a sense, it cannot be something that is uh, so so you know so far out you know that um, you know there's no connection with the work right it has to be informed somewhat okay okay this is a very simple diagram um, you know 
in a sense, giving you a snapshot of how to respond to a work of art. Okay, how to analyze a work of art. Okay, really has three layers, right? Three layers. Okay. Now the first layer is what you call form. Okay, we respond to a work of art's formal qualities. Okay, I'll talk, and that includes things like line, color, texture, composition, uh, etc. Okay, and the next layer is uh, what we call theme. Okay, and theme includes the subject matter of a work. Okay, let's say for example, turning back to the Mona Lisa. Right, what's the subject matter? It's a lady. Right? Okay, it's a lady. Or we go to Leonardo's other painting, The Last Supper. Right? What do we see there? The subject matter. 12, uh, 13 men. Okay? And then if now for theme there, there you know, beyond subject matter, okay, you also have uh, meaning, the meaning of a work, the content. Okay? Now the meaning of a work has to do with the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions. Of an artist, right? So you have the subject matter, okay, and also the meaning, content, right, etc. Okay. And finally, you know, context. Okay. Now, context really um, has to do with the interpretation of a work of art. Okay. Right. You go into a deeper interpretation of the work. Right. And um, here you analyze the work of art. Okay. Not so much as what you see. In the work of art, but is broader. Look, I mean, situating the work of art within its larger political, social, cultural, religious, you know, even personal context. Okay. Now I'll deal with all this separately. Okay, as we go on. Now, if you look at you know Mona Lisa, there are really, you know. I mean, so many questions that you can ask about it, right? And I've uh, included a handout. Okay, what are some of these questions? And all of these questions relate to the three, the, the form, theme, and context that you saw in the previous slide. Okay, so. You have the formal qualities like line, color, texture, okay, and then um, the, the subject matter, right, of, of the work, okay, as well as, um, uh, you know, the commissioning. Who commissioned this particular work? Now, that's a, a very important question to ask, okay, a very important question, particularly as we look at uh, the works of the masters, okay, that's to say, you know, uh, works of the Renaissance and the Baroque. Okay, who commissioned the work? Okay, because the person who commissioned the work, okay, must have a certain motif. Okay, and what's that motif? Okay, it could be a political motif, for example. Right? Okay, a person could commission the work uh, as a kind of, uh, you know, ostentatious display or demonstration of the person's wealth and status, for example. Right? So we always have to question ourselves. Okay, now a lot of some people see you know works of art as political in nature. Okay, now that has to do with interpretation, of course, right? But some other people have um, other ideas as well. I think I just added this uh, this slide. You don't have it, okay, on your handout. Now, if we look at this painting, the Mona Lisa, and you know we want to respond it respond to it, okay, um, you know, what is our first response to this painting? Now, it's um, said that when you look at a work of art, okay, you will respond, you will respond first to its formal qualities. That's to say, to the lines, the colors, the shapes, the texture, okay, rather than who is represented there in the work. Okay, I don't know how true is that, okay, maybe it's true for some of you. Okay, when you look at a work of art, okay, the first thing you see are the colors and the shapes, etc. Okay, rather than, you know, what is represented in a painting. Okay, so if we look at this work of art, if we go to just respond to the formal qualities, right? Now, before going further, let me tell you what the formal qualities are, right? And what makes this uh, work so fascinating? 
Okay, I think it's really to do with the techniques of Leonardo da Vinci, right? Because uh, he was an innovator in uh, in many ways, right? And one of the the techniques which he developed, okay, and which was to become very influential, okay, is what you call chiaroscuro. If you can look at the second word, okay, um, is Italian for light, dark. Okay, meaning to say, um, you know. If you look at this painting, right, you can see that Leonardo used very pronounced contrast of light and dark, okay, which gives the painting a three-dimensional effect or quality. Right? Now maybe with the lighting, you can't see that clearly, but you know, I mean you can always go back and you know look at this painting, enjoy it, you know, in your in your private moment, right? Because I think the lighting sort of affects right the how we see the, the picture. Okay, now another um, technique which he used, okay, and I think which causes this um, us to, to, or which co causes this painting to, to look very ambiguous, okay, is what he calls fumato. Okay, now fumato is another Italian term, okay, which can roughly um, translate to um, vapor or smokiness. Right or, or, or mistiness, okay, and you know, and really the sfumato is what they call a blending of tone and color, all right. And for the Mona Lisa, it's used, right, partic in particular for the the corner of the eyes and the corner of the lips. Okay, now this technique means that you know there are no outlines or borders being used. Okay, so with the use of sfumato, you can, you know, create. A kind of uh, ambiguous um, effect in the painting, so much so that you know when we look at the Mona Lisa, we don't know exactly what mood she's in. Okay, now is she really smiling? Okay, you can see that you know. Well, maybe after a while, you know, she doesn't smile anymore. All right. So, is that sort of uh, effect that you know, Leonardo was able to create with the use of sfumato? Right. And then you also have uh, he also uses what you call aerial perspective. Now, if you look at the background, the landscape, right, you can see that um, there are some uh, misty effects or atmospheric effects, right. Now, aerial perspective involves the use of uh, very cool colors, okay, as well as very subtle lines for things in the distance, okay. So this is meant to give the painting a kind of uh, a, a depth, right, a distance, okay. And lastly, here. Uh, he was also very innovative in the in the in the pose of the the sitter. Now, a person who poses for a portrait is called sitter, right? And you know this this is what you call a three quarter profile view, right? It's a it's a kind of a cross between a frontal view and a sideways view. A sideways view is called a profile view. Okay, so in Italy, you know, Leonardo was one of the first to use this uh, this three quarter profile view. Okay, so what I've um, just discussed, okay, briefly is the formal qualities of the painting. Okay, the techniques, the processes that Leonardo used to paint the Mona Lisa. Now, if you're going to stop at the formal quality, then, you know, our understanding of the work is incomplete. Okay, because we have to ask, who is this lady that's posed for Leonardo da Vinci? Right? Who commissioned this work? Now, according to um, certain sources like Vasari, now Vers Giorgio Vasari was the one who um, who uh, wrote the book called Lives of the Artists. Right? It's, a, it's really a biography of a Renaissance artists. Okay, he's a contemporary of many of the great Italian artists. And according to him, okay, this lady here that posed for the portrait, okay. Um, is the wife of a rich merchant, Francesco Dal Giaconda. Okay? Apparently her first name is Lisa. That's why it's called Mona Lisa. Right? My Lady Lisa. Right? Mona Lisa. Okay? So um, I suppose so you know that that's um, looking at the, the theme and the contextual aspects of the work. Okay, so really when we look at a work of art, we have to go beyond if we can beyond the formal aspects of the work, okay, to look at the thematic and the contextual aspects okay, of the work.
it has a lot to be said. I can, I mean, I can have a whole lecture on this. Right? I remember I once gave a talk on uh, when the book came out. Uh, what book is that? Dan Brown's book, right? Okay, I gave a talk to debunk some of the things that Dan Brown said about uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Okay, um, just... Okay, now to, to, to uh, first start with formal analysis, looking deeper into formal analysis. Now, this is a, a very famous quote by Frank Steller. Okay, Frank Steller was, is a, is, he's still living. Okay, he's um, a very famous uh, minimalist artist. Okay, now, I mean, minimalist artists are uh, used, as the name suggests, you know, very minimal lines, colors, you know, etc. Okay, there's another minimalist artist called Robert Ryman who only creates white paintings, for example. Okay, that's why they are known as minimalists. Okay, and um, Frank Steller's uh, famous quote, okay, is what you see is what you see. Okay, a painting is just that. Okay, you can call it art for art's sake. Right, it's just, it's just that, okay, there are no sort of um, uh, moral stories to tell, no narrative, okay, no subject matter. Okay, but that's uh, Frank Steller's perspective. Okay, so really, I mean, uh, you know, uh, formal analysis is really an explanation of the visual structure of the ways in which the artist puts together, um, you know, the visual elements of a work of art, like line, color, texture, etc. Right, puts together, arranges them. Right, uh, either on a canvas or you know, or even on a piece of sculpture. Okay. So strictly speaking, okay, when you use a formal analysis, okay, subject matter is not considered, okay, nor the historical or political context of the work. Right. Okay, but now this holds true for certain works. Okay, like this work, for example. Okay, it's a totally abstract work. Okay. Now, is it true that this work? has no subject matter, okay, or has no content. Okay, I'll come to that again later, right? So this, this is a, an interesting uh, thing to consider. Okay, I've also included, a, you know, a diagram that I drew up. Now, formal analysis, really, I mean, the, the you know, it's really um, talking about as I said, the formal qualities of a work of art, okay? And those formal qualities are lines, colors, textures, okay, etc. They are in turn affected by the media and techniques that the artists use. Okay, so for example, if you use oil or watercolor, it will give you a different effect, all right? Okay, and it also depends on the technique which you use. Okay, throwing a paint on a canvas, using your finger, for example, will produce different techniques than brushing on, okay, on a piece of canvas. Okay, and then, you know, and that will produce certain effects like rhythm, uh, pattern, okay, um, you know, balance, etc. Okay, and so we are talking now about the composition of the work. So you take colors, lines, etc., right, and then you arrange them, okay, in a certain composition. Okay, and that will give you the form of the work. Okay, now the form of the work is really what you see, right, on the on a piece of art. Okay, whether it's a figure or an, or an object. Okay, that's the form of the work, right. And lastly, all that, okay, adds up to the style of the artist. So you can see that you know different artists have different styles. Okay, because they put together these visual elements in different ways, right, and they use different materials. Okay, so really that's in a nutshell what formal analysis or visual elements. Okay, is. Yes. I'm sure you know most of you know Paul Cezanne, okay, the post impressionist artist. Okay, and um, now in the late 19th century, with the rise of movements like impressionism and post impressionism to which Cezanne belongs to, um, artists began to look beyond subject matter. Okay. They, they began to look beyond subject matter, right? They began to explore colors and textures and all the other formal qualities for their own sake, 
okay, for their own sake. So, so you need, I suppose, you know, you need a certain language in order to explain, for example, Cezanne's work. Okay, right. So, um, there are writers and critics, okay, who felt that you know Cezanne's work needed a different type of response. Okay, a response that is based only on formal analysis and nothing else. Okay, so. You have um, the art, the English art critic and writer. He's also an artist, okay, Roger Fry. Okay, who um, you know who 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 have analyzed uh, Cezanne's work. Okay, and he came up. I mean, this is just an excerpt of uh, what he says about that previous painting. Okay, which is still life with compotier. Okay, compotier is a dish for holding fruits. Now, just take a moment to read. Okay, the the, the quotation. Okay, so you can see that all he is concerned with, okay, is the formal techniques that Cezanne used, okay, for his painting. Okay, he's describing mainly the brush strokes, okay, the, the cross hatching brush strokes which Cezanne used. Okay, so if you look at Cezanne's work, you know he's really an innovative painter, okay, when it comes to painting. Right, when when it comes to experimenting with materials and techniques, okay, because. With the use of this, um, okay, a certain type of brush strokes, it gives his work a kind of geometric quality. Okay, it gives his apples and oranges a certain weight, a certain solidity, right? That you don't see, for example, in the works of the of the impressionists. Okay. Okay, so you know, I suppose you know when you look. May, perhaps this formal analysis is, is, is most relevant okay, when used to discuss abstract paintings. Right? Abstract paintings. Okay, which, um, and even still life. I mean, what can you say about the subject matter here? Oh, there are apples and oranges and, you know, and a compotier for holding you know, fruits. <laughs> okay? But I'm sure that, that you, know, you, you can talk a little bit more about this in terms of subject matter. Okay, but only... What I'm trying to say is that you know the, the formal analysis of the work takes precedence, I suppose, over the subject matter for certain works of art. Okay, for certain works of art, particularly with contemporary art. But I'll talk. I'll be talking about that in my fourth lecture. Okay, how do you analyze you know contemporary work of art? Okay, which really you know aesthetics play no role at times in a contemporary work of art. Okay, I think I did show you last month, right? When I showed you Tracy Emin's bed, my bed. Oh, you see that it's a, a found object, a bait. Now, what can you say about that work? Okay, how can you do a formal analysis? Okay, or you can say, oh, that's, that's the bait and the bait sheet, you know. I mean, it's, it's tough, right? So, for those type of works, you, you perhaps have to use a different type of analysis, as I said, the thematic or the contextual analysis. Okay, and I mentioned that Tracy Emin's work is um, very autobiographical. Okay, so it's good to use a contextual analysis to look at a work. Oh, I'm mindful of my time. Time flies, huh? 8 10. No, we started, I believe, at 7 40, so I've got about, try to finish it in half an hour or so. And then we'll open the time to question and answer. Now, do you all know this man? Jackson Pollock. Okay, very famous American artist. I mean, Jackson Pollock and his group of what is now known as abstract expressionist artists, okay, were the ones who really. Um, brought New York or America onto the international art scene. Okay, at that time, Paris was still the cultural center, the art center of the world. Okay, but Pollock and uh, his fellow ex abstract expressionist artists, um, you know, uh, made great strides, right, in the art world. And here is a very famous uh, a photograph by Hans Nemoth showing Jackson Pollock at work in his studio. Now, Pollock, I think he became famous because of his, um, rev he revolutionized the art of painting. Okay, he revolutionized the art of painting. Right? So, for example, instead of the easel, he would affix his canvas onto the floor. Okay? Instead of using brushes, he would use a trowel, a stick. Okay? Instead of brushing on his pigment, he would flick, pour, throw the paint onto the canvas. 
And, um, you know, so those, those are just some of the, and instead of using um, your normal, you know, um, pigments for painting, he will use normal household industrial paint. Right? And what he would do is that he would just go dance around the canvas and he would flick and throw and pour paint onto the canvas. Now, you think the result will be very messy, right? Okay, I'll show you one of his works. And you can see, you know, he even leaves his footprints on the canvas. Wow, this one makes me hungry, yeah? All of you know what this is? This is a pizza. Okay, about 16 inches across or in diameter. Right? Um, he has a golden crust. Right? He has a layer of uh, cheese and diverse toppings. Right? Now, how is the pizza... What, what similarity does a, a pizza share with a painting by Jackson Pollock? Okay? For example, number three. Okay, I will say first and foremost is... Now, I'm going to compare these two... Well, one is one is one is what you can you can eat, right? Of course, you can't eat a Jackson Pollock's work, <laughs> right? But um, I'm trying to make a kind of a comparison between the two. Okay, so I think the first thing that they share in or they have in common is um, the presentation. Okay, although both have very different purposes. Okay, what they share is first and foremost the presentation, the overall presentation. Okay, so Pollock's work as well, right? Um, you know, what you have is he pours paint on the different colors on the canvas, okay, and he's concerned very much also with the overall presentation of the work, right? Now, we're going to look at next at the um, colors, okay, the colors used. Okay, you can see that, um, now going back to the pizza, right? You can see that, you know, even for the, for the pizza, the chef, all right, now the chef is like an artist, I suppose. Okay, what he's trying to create is a visually pleasing arrangement of diverse ingredients. So what you have here is red and green peppers, glossy olives, okay, juicy mushrooms, right, um, translucent onions. Okay, all of that you know adds to the visual effect of the pizza. Okay, right, and. You know, I, I don't know whether you've come across you know, times when you order a pizza and all the olives are on one side, you know, right? Okay? It makes you lose a bit of appetite, you know, right? Okay. Now, likewise with Pollock's work. Now, if you can just trace one color with your eyes, okay, any color, it could be the green, the yellow, the black, okay? You can see that these colors occur as strategic points throughout the canvas. Okay, so in, a, in other words, there's no accumulation of one color Okay, on one part of the canvas. Okay, all the colors occurs at strategic points. Okay, resulting in a kind of overall rhythm, okay, of the work. And this is amazing. I mean, bearing the fact that I told you that Pollock just dances around the canvas, throwing flicking paint. Okay, so his technique is one that combines both control and chance. Okay, and he said that, you know, when you know, during that time when Pollock first produced his works, there were a lot of copycats, okay? But no one was able to do, okay, like what Pollock did, okay? Oh, okay, coming back to this, now let me go to... And then we compare the textures, okay, textures. Um, now you'll see that the, the, you know, if you look at the pizza, Right, it's stressed, uh, what you call, uh, there's a stress on irregular surfaces. Okay, and the irregular surfaces are, um, of course, created by the, um, you know, the, the different ingredients. Okay, like the crust, the cheese, okay, and the diverse toppings. Okay, now likewise, Pollock's work use alternating thickness and thinness of the paint. Okay, so there's a combination of, you know, thick and thin paints. Right? And, you know, of, often also Pollock adds extra artistic materials onto his canvas. So you add objects like his cigarettes, you know, he likes to smoke, okay, while he paints. Okay, so he will add that to his canvas, he will add things like glass onto his canvas. So that gives his, his canvas a rich texture, right, a rich texture. 
Okay, and also as you, you if you notice, there's also an emphasis on um, curving forms. Okay, or curved forms. Okay, and for the pizza, the curved forms. Okay, are achieved by you know the the, the shape of the the olives, right? The sliced olives, the mushroom caps. Okay, and in Pollock's work, it's achieved by the line, the, the curvature of the line. You know, as Pollock dances around, you know, the, the line sort of follow his the movement of his hand. Okay, right. Okay, as he throws and, and, and flicks the paint onto the canvas, as he moves around the canvas. Okay, so that's just a very brief comparison of a pizza and a painting. Okay. So I hope that gives you a good idea of you know, um, you know what what uh, formal analysis mean. Now again, this is best look at you know with very uh, you know with in fact better still with no light at all. Okay, then you can really admire the dramatic effect. Okay, created by Caravaggio's uh, technique. Okay, Caravaggio. Okay, I think some of you know. Okay, he's uh, a Baroque painter. Okay, a Baroque painter, and he's best known for his um, very dramatic use of chiaroscuro. Okay, you have been introduced to that term earlier. Okay, the use of light and dark. Okay, um, you know to, to create, and and what Caravaggio want, wanted to do in this painting is that he wants to create a very convincing illusion of a real scene taking place. Okay, a real scene taking place. Okay, and um, now how does he do that? Okay, how does he do that? Now, um, maybe before going further, I've just something to say briefly about the subject matter. Okay, now if you look at the title, it tells you straight away what the subject matter is. Supper at Emmaus. Okay, now this was um, an occasion when Jesus met. You know, this was after his death. He was crucified and according to the Bible, he was, okay, he rose again. Right? Okay, and um, this was when he met his disciples along the road. They decided to invite him for supper. Okay, but they didn't know yet his identity. Okay? And it was all revealed here at this moment, this dramatic moment in time. Okay, when Jesus revealed who he was. Okay, so can you see how the disciples reacted? Okay, with, uh, with shock and, and with disbelief. Okay, one of them almost fell from his chair. Okay, right. Okay, look, right, fell from his chair. Okay, let's, let's look at um, this uh, more closely. Okay. Now, firstly, the, you know, if you analyze this painting, okay, using formal analysis, Right? So you look at these various aspects. Okay, let me talk about the tone. As I mentioned earlier, you know, um, Caravaggio was a master in using chiaroscuro. Rather, Caravaggio was a master in using chiaroscuro. The, the contrast of light and dark. Okay, to create uh, very dramatic three-dimensional effects. But he was also controversial. Okay, he was actually criticized, you know, for making you know, religious subjects like Jesus and his, and his disciples seem uh, human. Okay, he would pick his models from the streets, you know, and then use them for his painting. Okay, so he did not seek, in a sense, to idealize his figures. Okay, his, his religious subjects are very ordinary, common folks. Okay. So that's tone. Now, the next one we look at is uh, perspective. Okay, if you look at perspective, you know, again, there's that in the painting. Right? He has used perspective to convince us that what we are looking at is a real scene. Okay? And if you can look at the, um, the corner of the tablecloth, okay? also echoes the, the shape of the, um, the group here. Right? They, are, they are grouped in what you call a pyramidal composition, okay? a triangular composition. Okay? So the edge of the tablecloth also, or the table, echoes okay? the, the shape. Okay, of, of the group there, of the group of figures. Right. Oh, sorry, I, I, I think I jumped the gun, right? I, I, I'll, I'm still going to talk about perspective, okay? I have to introduce you to this term called foreshortening. Okay, foreshortening is a type of perspective. Okay, now can you see the, um, the disciple on the right extending his arm? Okay, and also Jesus, you know, raising his uh, right arm. Okay, now by doing that, they're actually projecting into our space. Okay, now that's the use of 
foreshortening or foreshortened perspective. Okay? Again, is Caravaggio's attempt to convince us, right, or to create a kind of illusionistic scene, right, through these techniques. And then we have also have composition. I talk about the composition. Firstly, if you look at the disciples, you know, uh, the, the figures rather, they are grouped in what they call a triangular or pyramidal composition, okay, with Christ in the center. Okay? But you see a, a, a figure standing on the left. Okay? Now, if there's no figure on the left, then the whole picture will look very balanced and symmetrical. Do you all agree? Okay, with the figure on the left, standing there on the left, it disrupts the symmetry okay, of the composition. Now, Caravaggio must have done this for a reason. Okay, now, as I mentioned, this scene depicts a moment when the disciples discovered that it was Jesus who was eating with them. Right? So they reacted with shock and, and disbelief. Okay? So perhaps by putting the figure there, disrupting the whole balance, that's what Caravaggio wanted to achieve. Okay? He, he wanted to add a more dramatic effect to the painting. Right? So sometimes you see that formal, the formal elements of the work okay, cannot be separated from the meaning of the work. Okay? Okay, they are both, in a sense, um, you know, inseparable at times. Right? Okay, and also, if you look at it, I mean, the, the whole use of chiaroscuro was to, to make the whole scene look very dramatic. Okay? And, and it suits this, um, this particular subject uh, very much. Okay? And then we look at the colour. What do you notice about the colour? Okay, you can see that the, the painting is dominated by two colours, mainly red and white. Okay, and if you look at the red and whites, they are, in a sense, evenly spread out okay, um, throughout the painting. All right? And um, the colours used are also very descriptive, okay? meaning to say that they are naturalistic. They are true to the subject. Right? They are true to the subject. And lastly, we talk about texture. Right? What do you notice about the texture? Now, the texture is what, in this painting, is what we call tactile. T-A-C-T-I-L-E, tactile. Meaning that when we look at this painting, when we look at the, clo the clothing of the figures, the, the fruits, the food on the table, okay, we can feel them when we look at them. Okay, so it's, it's very tactile. Right? The textures are very tactile. Right? Okay, so that's a formal analysis of this painting. Okay, um, now the theme, as I mentioned, has to do with the subject matter, okay, the meaning of a work, right, as well as the content, okay, and um, historians and scholars, they have developed, um, you know, different ways of looking at the meaning of a painting, okay, and one of these ways is what they call iconography, okay, and it was... This is a technique developed by an art historian, a German art historian called Erwin Panofsky. Right? And it's a branch of art history which deals with studies, the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. Okay, and this is in uh, Panofsky's own words. Right? Okay, it's the branch of the history of art which concerns itself with the subject matter or meaning of books of art as opposed to form. Now, can you see that? Okay, so Erwin Panofsky's, um, he has taken another position, okay? He's looking more now at the subject matter, the meaning of a work of art, rather than the formal quality, okay? Now, iconography is always very useful to identifying images, right? So, for example, you know, I mean, if you just look at sculpture, for example, Buddhist, Hindu sculpture, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of different gods and goddesses. Okay? Now, will you be able to identify that particular deity when you see it? Okay? So one easy way is, of course, uh, if you look at um, you know, a, a, a figure like this. Okay? Now, who is this? This figure with four arms, carrying various, what you call, attributes. Okay, these are his attributes. Okay, the objects that he carry. Okay, 
Now, certain deity carry certain attributes. So you'll be able to identify that particular god or goddess if you're able to, um, you know, if you know what attributes they carry. Okay, so Vishnu normally appears uh, with four arms. Okay, and these are the common attributes that you carry. The corn shell, the chakra or the wheel, the lotus. Okay, all of them symbolizing um, various things. Okay, so likewise the Buddha, right? The Buddha, I think I spoke about it last month briefly. Okay, he's, he's being shown with certain, uh, I mean, what you call the iconography of the Buddha, right? He's always shown with a balm on his head, right? Sits on a lotus throne, okay? He would be shown with hand gestures, etc. Okay, so that's what you call iconography. Okay, so I'm going to use this example, okay, to talk about iconography or the subject matter or meaning of a work of art. Okay, have you, anyone uh, sort of familiar with this work? Hmm. Okay, a couple of you. You might have seen it as well, right? In the National Gallery in, uh, uh, in England, the UK. Right? Okay, and uh, it's called the Anofini. Now, it used to be called the Anofini Wedding, right? But I think the, uh, the gallery wanted to take a more um, uh, neutral stance, right? Because it's not proven that this is actually a wedding. Okay, so they name it the Anofini Double Portrait, right? Okay, now, um, now this work is subject to much speculation. Okay, and that's what makes it uh, quite interesting as well. Okay, and um, it was Panofsky's interpretation of this painting, okay, that, um, you know, it's still very much, um, in a way, seen, seen as the, the accepted version. But many other people have come up with their own versions. Okay, so when Panofsky looked at this painting, all right, Okay, now, in terms of subject matter, the, now, when we look at it, we just look at, you know, there is taking place in a kind of, I don't know, a bedroom, perhaps, okay, or, or a hall, okay, of a home, okay, you have a couple there, they're holding hands, okay, they are, they are dressed uh, in, in rather opulent clothing, okay, and they are quite expensive objects all around, the chandelier, the mirror, etc. Okay, but Panofsky wanted to find out more, what are the symbolic meanings of all these, you know, the objects and even the gestures of the couple. Okay, what's, what's the whole meaning of all this? Okay. So of course, to do that, he has to do some research, right? Okay, he has to do some research. He has to plow through documents. He has to look at other paintings, okay, other similar paintings. Okay. And he came to this conclusion that what is taking place here is a wedding. Okay, it's a marriage. Now he even went further. He even went further. He said that this painting itself is, you know, like your ROM, huh? if you go to Registry of Marriages. Okay, if you register, you get a certificate. So according to Panofsky, this is a wedding certificate, the painting itself. Okay? And to support his argument, okay, he pointed out to a few clues in this painting. Can you see this signature here? At the back, it says Jan van Eyck was here. Now, Jan van Eyck was the Flemish painter, okay, who did this painting. Okay, so apparently the artist was present. Okay, Jan van Eyck was here. And can you see the mirror at the back? Okay, now in the mirror, you can see two other people. Okay, two other people, right? And according to Panofsky, he argued that these two people were witnesses to a marriage. So he needed two people to be witnesses okay, to a marriage. And their formal hand gestures, okay, according to Panofsky again, okay, those hand gestures signify that okay, a wedding, right, a marriage is taking place. Okay, a, a kind of a vow okay, was being done here. Okay. Of course, Panofsky's position has been challenged now okay, by many people who say that well, there are documents that prove that, you know, during this date, okay, when, when the painting was done, okay, there was, there's no evidence that, you know, that they were married. Okay. Now, to further support his claim, right, Panofsky looked at the various objects, right, in this painting. Okay, he looked at the dog. Can you see the dog? 
Is it a terrier breed? Right? It's like a terrier. Alright, and then okay, if you look at the dog, right? The chandelier, the oranges on the windowsill, and on the chest. Now, if you look at the, you know, the fact that if you look at their footwear, okay, or what you call their patterns, okay, you see that, you know, they have taken off their footwear. Again, according to Panofsky, because they are actually standing on holy ground. This is a sacred marriage. Okay, they are standing on holy ground. Okay, now the chandelier has a single lighted candle. Okay, and according to Panofsky, it symbolizes the, um, it could be the divine presence of God. Okay, or the all-seeing eye of God, okay, the single lighted candle. Okay? And there are also clues that point to fertility, the concern with you know, childbearing, which is a biblical sort of uh, injunction. You know, right? okay? um, oh, by the way, before that, okay, if you look at the... Now, these, two, these couple here, um, they are what do you call the, the Giovanna and Giovanni Amofini. Okay, they were originally from Italy. Okay, then they settled in Bruges in, uh, in Belgium. Okay, they were wealthy, um, he was a wealthy merchant. Okay, and um, if you look at Giova Giovanna's, um, uh, is she really pregnant, you think? Right? Are you sure? She looks pregnant to me. Okay, now, of course, you know, at that time, Right? It would have been taboo, you know, right? Okay, if we were to be married before, uh, you know, you were pregnant before you were married. So, of course, you know, here is only symbolic. Okay, she holds up the excesses of a, of a gown, okay, to, in a sense, simulate pregnancy. Okay, to show that they'll, she'll soon be able to bear children. Okay, and there are other clues that, um, you know, uh, suggest fertility here. The oranges, okay, the oranges symbolizes what you call natural abundance, okay, fertility. And there's also a, a, a statue at the back of the chair, right, um, which shows St. Margaret, who is the patron of childbirth. Okay, so all, there are all these clues. Okay, and also the, if you look at the mirror, okay, now the mirror has some decorative motifs showing the passion of the cross or the stations of the cross. So you see all this religious symbolism in the painting, okay? That led Panofsky to conclude that this is actually a sacred wedding taking place, right? Now I'll return to this uh, this painting again, okay? But that's Panofsky's interpretation. Oh, and the dog. You are wondering about the dog, okay? And according to Panofsky, okay, um, one of the dog's traditional symbolism is of fidelity, faithfulness to marriage. Okay, so the dog actually symbolizes. Fidelity. So you can see how you know an interpretation can add or can make any a, a painting a work of art okay, more interesting. Now I just uh, talk about this briefly by Mark, uh, a painting by Mark Rothko. Okay, I mean his uh, works. If you have you are following the market, you know his works. Uh, as with the works of Jackson Pollock and the other abstract expressionists, you know, I mean once their works go on the um, you know, to the, the auction house, you know, it's bound to break, break records, right? Same with uh, Rothko's work. Um, now this is a, and his works are large. I mean, some of you have seen it in, in, in person, okay? Sometimes over two meters, right? Uh, in height, right? And um, now why I show you this painting is this. Now how do you respond to this work? Okay, as I mentioned before, when I, I pointed to that painting over there, okay? Is it only on a formal level? Is it only on, you know, you know, looking at the, the techniques, the colors, okay, that Rothko look, uh, that, that Rothko used, okay, or can we go further, right? Now, it's really difficult if you, you know, you have not read, you know, about the artist's life and, you know, his, his uh, about his works, okay, so all you can do is just to admire the colors and, and the luminosity of the work, right? But if you were to read what the artist says about his work, Okay, this is what it says. I'm interested in expressing only basic human emotions. Okay, and the fact that people break down and cry. You know, people actually broke down and cry. Okay, I don't know um, how true that is. Okay, 
show that I communicate these basic human emotions. Have you all stood before a Rothko work? Okay. You have? Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you cry? Oh no, okay. No, I think, you know, it again depends on your emotive state, right? Okay, I mean, uh, I mean, if you are really sad and depressed, of course, you know, the colors uh, could, could make you cry. I mean, it's, you know, it can be true, right? Okay, so what I'm saying is that even an abstract work like this, this is an abstract piece of painting, okay, can have content. And that content is the, the emotions, the feelings, and the thoughts of the artist. Okay? Because Rothko also went through a very tough time. I mean, he, he took his own life at the end. Okay? So he communicated all these emotions on the painting. So in a sense, there can be content as well okay? in a piece of abstract painting like this. Right? Okay, lastly, context. Okay, um, context. Now, context, as I mentioned, you know, looks at a work, a work of art in its broader political, social, uh, cultural uh, context, okay, which may or may not be evident in a work of art, okay. Now, there's this term uh, that a lot of uh, writers use today, you know, it's called reading, okay. When we look at a work of art, we also read the work of art, okay. Now, that term reading is borrowed from semiotics. Semiotics is uh, the the language of signs, S-I-G-N-S, okay? So when we look at a piece of work, we actually read it, okay? We treat the work of art like a text, okay? So according to certain um, uh, writers and scholars, okay, when you look at a work of art, okay, there's a text, what you read, and there's also the subtext. Subtext is beneath the text, okay? It's not so evident, okay? So you're actually reading it against the grain, Okay, you are reading the work of art against the green. You are using a bit of interpretation as well. Okay. So context will include factors such as okay, historical events, political circumstances, etc. Okay. And um, so the knowledge of context of, of an artwork can provide for more detailed analysis and investigation. So throughout, um, I mean, you know, from the 70s onwards, um, art historians and scholars, they have developed certain ways of looking at the work of art, okay? And those certain ways are linked with their own political persuasion, their background, okay? So for example, in the late 19 or early, early 1970s, okay, there was the rise of um, the feminist art movement in the US. Okay, and it's linked to you know women's rights and all that, all right? And with the rise of the feminist art movement, okay, uh, women curators, scholars, writers, historians, they began to look at the work of art with a different perspective, with a feminist perspective, more from the position of women. Okay, all right? Okay, and others have taken different positions. Like you even have Marxist scholars, okay. Of course, Marxist art historians look at the work of art as um, a struggle, you know, as a class struggle between the bourgeois, right, the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, okay, the common people, right? Okay, then, and, and there are others as well, okay, like psychoanalysis, biographical. Now, biographical is when you analyze a work of art in terms of the political circumstances of the artist, okay? So for example, when you look at Van Gogh's work, okay, we cannot help but feel that the dynamic tension between his lines and colors have something to do with his mental state, right? Okay, so that's, that's looking at, you know, um, a, a work of art from a biographical point of view, okay? I just want to close by showing you uh, three paintings, okay, that demonstrates that you know, a work of art can have a political intent or can be political in nature. I, again, it depends on how you read it. This is again a matter of interpretation. Okay. Now, a work like this by Jean-Leon Jérôme. Okay, uh, 
And Jean Jean Jerome belonged to you know, a group of artists in the 19th century okay, who are known to produce what is now known as Orientalist paintings. Okay, Orientalist paintings. And the term Orientalist refer mainly to countries like Africa or the Middle East. Okay. And um, now, this group of paintings have now been, I mean, have been criticized okay, by certain scholars and historians okay, who took certain positions like feminists, um, you know, the feminist scholars, okay, or you know, even the, the orientalist scholars. Right? And to the feminists, okay, they, they felt that such orientalist paintings okay, um, portray the kind of um, racist or sexist attitudes towards women. Okay, towards women. So what you see here, the subject matter here, is actually a slave market. Okay, and you can see here there are there are slave traders. Okay, they are. I mean, there you see the slave in the nude. Right, it's a woman. Okay, so feminists will argue that such paintings denigrated women. Okay, demean women. Okay, woman is being sold as a commodity, bought and sold as a commodity. Okay, and it's especially, um, I would say, offensive, especially in the context of the Middle East or Africa. Okay, where women are supposed to cover themselves. Okay, I mean, you know, here you have a woman being shown in a nude. Right. So many of these Orientalist painters like um, Jerome didn't travel to Africa or the Middle East. Okay, they painted out of their own imagination, right? Okay, so so to to some of these um, scholars, okay, um, historians who saw these paintings, okay, there are other paintings like this similar to this where they show um, a harem. A harem is you know where concubines are kept, okay, or where they show um, you know even women smoking the hookah, right, the water pipe, okay. So, so you know. The scholars felt that some of these images portray a certain um, picture of the Orient, of Africa and the Middle East. Okay, right. So they consider this uh, these paintings to, you know, in a sense to to um, fit into the imagination of the colonizers, right? Or how the, how the colonizers want these places to be seen, right? Okay. So to these scholars and historians, this type of pictures are emotional emotionally and politically charged. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, it's very alluring, it's very seductive. I mean, Jerome is a wonderful painter, you know, but as I said, there's more to it than, than meets the eye. And you can read the quote there by, uh, you know, I like the quote, it says that, you know, we are actually in, invited to look and to salivate. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it's, it is a picture man for the male gaze, right? Okay, for this, this is the sexual enjoyment, okay, of a male audience. Okay, so, so that's another perspective. Okay, two more to go. Now, this is another famous picture. I think uh, some of you would have seen it. Okay, Thomas Gainsborough. Okay, um, is um, sometimes titled Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Okay, or Robert Andrews and his wife. Okay. Now, to some people. Okay, when they look at this painting, now we cannot but admire, you know, Gainsborough's uh, skills and technique. Okay, he was one of the few painters who was able to successfully marry a portrait and a landscape. Right? Okay, and uh, you know, we have um, eminent historians like Sir Lawrence Gowring, okay, Kenneth Clark, right, who have, uh, you know, who, who, who have said some glowing words about the painting. Okay? But you have other historians like John Berger. Okay, John Berger wrote this uh, very small book but very influential book. Okay, some of you would have have it. It's called Ways of Seeing. Okay, and John Berger is actually a well. He has very left wing Marxist sentiments. Okay, so we know the position that it comes from, and that's why he, he made this quote. Okay, he's trying to say that this painting, by showing, you know, the the, the land, the estate of this couple, 
Okay, it's actually an ostentatious, extravagant display of the wealth, the possession, okay, and and the land of this couple. Okay, now so if you come from a Marxist sort of viewpoint, you will take this position, right? That this painting is nothing just not to show off, okay, the wealth and the status of this couple. And in fact, if you if you were to research into the background of this couple, it's probably true. Okay, because this whole marriage is a marriage. It's probably taken, um, Gainsborough was commissioned to do this painting probably not long after um, the couple was married. Okay, it was a marriage of convenience. Okay, both were wealthy. Okay, Robert Andrew's father made tons of money okay, from um, renting his property through charging high low, uh, interest. You know, okay, a bit reminds me of Tai Long, eh, the loan sharks. Okay, and um, and you know even the Prince of Wales, you know the Prince of Wales owe his father money, like the sum of thirty thousand pounds. Okay, that's roughly roughly equivalent to a few million dollars today, right? And the girl's parents were also in the textile business. Okay, so all in all, it was the marriage was like a business transaction. Now I'm talking like a Marxist historian, right? Okay, and. In fact, the land that you see there, right, and you can see the position, the composition of the painting is very interesting. Okay, the couple is shown on one side, not in the middle, so that they can show off their land, right? Okay, and the land is as far as the eye can see, and that's only part of the estate. Okay, because the 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 lady whose name is Frances, right, she actually gave part of the estate to her husband as part of a dowry. Yeah, at that time, woman had to pay dowry, okay? right? Not today anymore, but at that time, right? Okay, and you know, and I mean, if you look at the land, you want to go further. You can look at other things like the very um, the 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 width of field. Okay, they are sitting at the edge of a width of field. You see that the width of field is very neat. Okay, and it was it's probably because of the recently introduced seed drill. Okay, so you know this painting is also intending to show that you know the the the, the kind of the the wealth. Okay, um, of, of this couple in being able to afford that modern technology, right? Okay, even for their own land, right? Now, do you notice? I mean, if you look closer, if you go back, you all look closer. This painting is actually unfinished because if you if you see here, it's a patch of bare canvas, okay? And we are speculating what Gainsborough would have intended to put there. Okay, some people speculated that it's probably a baby or you know or something else. Right, but because of that, it's considered to be unfinished. Right. Okay, lastly, um, <clears throat> somewhere closer to home. Okay. Have you come across this, this picture? Very famous picture. Right, it was hung in the um, the Singapore Museum right a few years back, but they have taken it down. I think it will be shown at a newly uh, open museum right in twenty fifteen, the National Art Gallery. Okay, Chua Mia Tee's um, National Language Class. It's one of um, uh, our masterpieces. Okay. Now, this painting was uh, done in 1959. Okay. Now, anyone recall what happened in 1959? Singapore gained. Oh, don't know your history, right? Okay, never mind. Okay, Singapore gained self independence. Hey, sorry, is it Singapore? Hey, Malaysia. Oh, self government. Yeah, correct. Okay. Maybe I don't know my history. Self government. So it was a, a very important year, okay. And you know, in order to, to um, you know further analyze this painting in terms of its political, okay, um, sort of context, okay, we have to know who the artist is. Okay, Chua Mia Tee. He belonged to a society known as the Equator Equator Art Society. Okay, and the Equator Art Society was a, a society of artists which um, you know uh, which have left wing sentiments. Okay, they sympathize with the, the communists. Okay, and as you know, at that time the communists were, you know, um, staging a lot of strikes and rallies, right, against the colonial government. Okay, right. So and and members of the Equator Society normally depict um, very ordinary working class people in their works. Right, they were the ones who really uh, specialized in what you call woodblock print. Okay, woodblock print. Okay. Now. In this painting, again, if you look at it on the surface, it looks like 
an ordinary class taking place. Right? Okay, you see the teacher there and the students. Okay, but look closer. Okay, on the board, okay, it's written. Okay, Malay phrases. Okay, roughly translated to what is your name and where do you live? Now, I mean, in language class, you know, it's, it's harmless, right? I mean, those are very prosaic phrases that we use. Okay, what, what, what is your name and where do you live? Okay, you learn your language that way. But if you want to, to put the painting in a bigger context, you can interpret those phrases as something to do with national identity. Right? Okay, because at that time, you know, Singapore still aspire to, um, you know, to, to be independent. Okay? And the Equator Society was very anti-colonialist, very nationalist in its aims. Right? So remember the subtext that I told you, we can read the subtext in that way. Okay? That these phrases are more political than you think. Okay? And look at the students there, right? The students. Look at the clothes that they are wearing. Look at their ethnicity and their races. And what do you notice? Oh, they are comprise different ethnic groups. Okay. I mean, and they also comprise different, um, what do you call, uh, classes, I, I believe. Right? You can see the woman dressed in, is that Chong Sam? Okay. Dressed in a very elegant Chong Sam. Okay, while, while others are dressed in a, you know, in very simple clothing. Right? Okay, so you can see, you know, people from all walks of life coming together to learn a common language. And I believe that 1959 was also the year when Malay was declared okay, as a kind of a national language. Okay? So this whole painting was meant to assert the kind of national dignity and national identity right, of, of Singapore as a nation. Okay? I mean, there are other, there are, there are other sort of um, readings as well. The round table also signifies equality okay, rather than a square or rectangular table. So it blends in with the, the kind of Marxist or communist um, ideology of bringing different classes, races, okay, um, genders together in a kind of communitarian society. Right? Okay, so you can see that um, you know, a painting you know, can be read in many ways. Okay, so this is my last slide. Oops, sorry. Just go to now. How many of you look at the title of a work of art when you first view the work of art? Is that the first thing you look at? Second. Oh, second. So you look at the work first and then the title. Mm, okay. I think that that's a good way of looking at it, right? And as you know, you know, some artists, you know, sort of left their title untitled, okay, so as not to influence your perception of the work, right? Okay, but does the work of, does the title of a work of art matter, right? I think it does, it's helpful, okay? I mean, uh, the next time you step into a museum, you know, of course, you no, know, that's, that's the reason why they have text as well. I mean, it's good to read the text, okay? It can give you, um, you know, one perspective of the work of art. Okay, but don't accept it, you know, right, as the, the only perspective. Because I said, you know, today I, I've not talked a lot about interpretation, okay? But interpretation can come from many sides, okay? From the curator of the museum, from the artist, from yourself. Okay, so there are many ways to interpret a work of art, right? And one cannot say whether there's a right way or wrong way of interpreting it. So, and also the next time, you know, when you look at a work of art, of course, you know, when you're unfamiliar with the artist's work, okay, you have to do a bit more research into the artist. Okay, I think that's very useful and beneficial because the more you research in an artist, okay, the more you'll know about the artist. And the next time when you look at his work, you don't even need to research, you'll be able to tell, okay, his techniques, right, and the types of subject, okay, that he like to deal with, right, in his work. Okay, so with that, I would like to sort of uh, end my talk and maybe open this time for uh, some uh, Q&A. Okay, so
don't be shy. Uh, this particular session has been mainly focused on uh, paintings, but let's say if you want to do the same now on a uh, statue that we see here in front of us. Okay. What is one picture, one color? Right. Oh, okay. She wants me to analyze this sculpture. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I think you can apply the same formal analysis. It's no different. Okay, but of course, uh, sculpture also has its own terms. They are unique to the art form. All right? So for sculpture, for example, you look at, because it's three-dimensional, oh, am I supposed to touch? <laughs> okay, I make it a point never to touch an artwork, right, in a museum. Okay? <laughs> we talk about, for example, mass volume, okay, which is quite different, right? Because a two-dimensional, for example, painting, okay, don't have that mass of volume that you can talk about. Okay, so you can still do a, a formal analysis of the work. Okay, and of course, knowing Chinese sculptures, contemporary Chinese sculptures, many of them are also charged with political uh, meanings. Okay, so you have to find out as well. Okay, um, you have to do a bit of research um, into into the artist. Okay, and uh, you know, and that will give you perhaps an idea of what the artist is trying to say through his works. So that will be my next session on sculpture. I'll definitely talk more about this. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Anyone from behind, perhaps? This is your chance. Do you have any questions at all? There's a painting that you remember <laughs> but you couldn't quite get. Maybe you'd like to ask Mr. Jeffrey say well, you know, a little bit here. It's okay, you can always email me as well. <laughs> right? Yeah, thanks. I'm just curious, I mean, many of you are, I, I believe, are collectors here, am I correct? Okay, I don't know what you look for when you look at a work of art, right? Anyone, are you a collector? Some sort of. <laughs> okay. Right. Perhaps as a collector, it's always good. I mean, again, as I mentioned in my, at the start of my talk, you know, instinct, intuition play, play a role, right? But it's always, always good to know more about the artist and, and you have to research more. Uh, not only about the artist, but the work of art, right, as well. Okay. Okay, we don't have any more questions. Then uh, may I request for another round of applause from Mr. Jerky, please. Okay. And of course, to all of you for uh,